Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are pleased and honored to have our first guest from this province of New Brunswick here in the Great Confederation of Canada. Darcy Wallace is a political commentator in the province. Darcy, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about New Brunswick politics with me. Thank you very much, Chris. It's very nice to be here and talk to you today. So, Darcy, uh, there is a lot to digest over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how much we can cram in here. But I want to start with the state of politics today in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, Blaine Higgs, the premier, is uh, has a majority government. He went to the polls early a- after his minority government, uh, I think in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, in the summer and early fall of 2020, there was the last election. So he went to the polls. The voters of New Brunswick uh, graced him with a majority government. Uh, how, in your opinion, how how has Blaine Higgs uh, handled the last year and a bit since uh, that election? Uh, because I, from an outside outsider observer, I've, I'm seeing the news reports of potentially doing not so well. Poll numbers are not performing as well as they expect. There's rumors that Blaine Higgs could be leaving, could be retiring soon. But I don't know this because I haven't talked to someone on the ground and you're here to help me digest everything. So in your opinion, how has Blaine Higgs done since the last election? Well, well, well one of the things to remember is that is that the sky high approval ratings that not just not just Premier Higgs, but premiers across the, the, the country, in particularly in the Maritimes, the sky high approval ratings that, that we saw for them during COVID, that was that was a sugar high that, that inevitably it, it had that inevitably had to come down for all of them at some point. Um, what's 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 very interesting about the Higgs government is that here in the Maritimes at present we have a unique form of more progressive flavored progressive conservative premiers. What's interesting about the Higgs government is that the Higgs government will 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 be more aligned with that more progressive flavor like like we see with the premiers of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. But then every once in a while, it's like there's a fear of not being invited to sit at at the conservative table at the National High School cafeteria. And right out of left field, he will align himself with with, with Jason Kenney and Premier Mo in Alberta, like out out, out of left field every so often. Um, And so recently that happened. when all of the when all of the COVID rules were coming down here in New Brunswick, just in the last week, as with other provinces, um, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island decided that they were going they were going to take a more moderate uh, approach and just kind of scale back some of the COVID restrictions in phases uh, and keep the mask mandate in schools. Premier Higgs went completely aligned himself with 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 Jason Kenney and Scott Moe. And, and, and decided to get rid of, of the mask mandates at schools for students. And this week, when the federal liberals and the federal NEP announced their, uh, their supply agreement uh, partnership, um, Premier Higgs joined in with Jason Kenney and Scott Moe in, in demonizing that and in taking up the bat and once again, aligning himself with them again in the battle against the carbon tax, which 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 is very interesting. So in in he he'll 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 take this more more moderate approach to progressive conservatism, and then and it's like boom 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 boom, and then bang, he's got to align himself with with Jason Kenney and Scott Moe per- periodically from time to time to remind everybody that he's still in the club. Is that? Blaine Higgs trying to uh, punch above his weight because when you think of conservatism in this country, you don't think of people like Tim Houston. You don't think of people like Blaine Higgs or even Dennis mm-hmm. King, premier of uh, uh, PEI. Is this Blaine Higgs trying to be a national player on a stage where it has been so overwhelmed by Jason Kenney's and the Scott Moe's out here in the West. And people seem to forget that there is that conservative base of support in the Atlantic provinces. Um, so uh, I, I, I know that, I know that you have your, your, your background uh, with, with the, with the Dalton McGinty liberals in Ontario as, as a former staffer working with them. So in, in that sort of George Bush neocon era, I, I know that you guys saw it in Ontario, 
every every so often you 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 would run into you would run into young conservatives and it would seem like they they'd gone to one too many CPAC conferences and and they were and they were they were campaigning to be governor of Arizona rather than campaigning to represent uh, a small provincial constituency in in in, in Ontario. Um, Premier Higgs has actually has roots in the core party, which was a prairie populist party that was opposed to bi official bilingualism in the 1980s. Premier Higgs actually campaigned to be the leader of the core party in New Brunswick in the late 1980s, which is which is very interesting and, and, and has, it's part of the reason why he is so unpopular among Francophones and has zero representation in, a, in any majority Francophone writings in the province. So, um, and so he's aligned with a party that has roots. He, his, his own origin story is with a prairie populist conservative party that had a bit of support in the late 80s and early 90s in New Brunswick. So there is, there is, there is, a, there is a history there that goes back for his, entire, for his entire political identity. So part of the reason why I use that, that comparison to to neocon conservatives campaign like they were running to be governor of Arizona is, is Blaine Higgs would love to be premier of, of Saskatchewan more than anything in the world some days. Cause um, you know, the people from Saskatchewan are quite nice but they're also the most conservative, uh, they're the most conservative province in the country and they're an oil and gas province and premier Higgs has a background as an oil and gas executive. Like, so, so I, to me, there, every, every so often, the, 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 dream, the, the, the dream and the fantasy of Higgs for Premier of Saskatchewan, will, 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 you'll, you'll see little traces of it. So you, you mentioned something that I don't think a lot of people realize about Blaine Higgs, and I'm glad you brought it up because I know a little bit, but you probably know a little bit more being someone who's actually from New Brunswick. But you talk about that party in the 1980s the core uh, the core party and can you just explain to my listeners what that means because uh i i it, from what i understand it was a party that was a very much against the bilingualism of canada but also the bilingualism of new brunswick and if you remember 1980s in new brunswick these were the frank mckenna years these were the years that the liberals dominated the, the province so can you just talk to me talk to me a little bit about how we got from per, someone who was very much a anglophone and kind of is to this day i'm not sure if he's still taking french classes or not to a uh premier of a province uh, sure, I, I, I would actually be, I would be happy to, to, to talk about that. So um, Premier Higgs ran to be the leader of the core party in the 1980s. Um, the, 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 the Liberal Party led by, by Brian Gallant in the, in the 2018 election when Brian Gallant and Blaine Higgs uh, ran against each other. The, the Brian Gallant led Liberal Party made sure that every Francophone in the province saw every pamphlet Every quote, every newspaper article from from that campaign. So um, I'm very familiar, I'm very familiar with 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 that period. So um, Premier Higgs, um, at that at, when he when he initially entered into politics in the late '80s and had that wonderful late 1980s mustache. Um, <laughs> If if I have um, if I can find the photo, there will be a photo on YouTube of uh, Lane Higgs with a giant '80s mustache right now. <laughs> um, so he so he was he was opposed um, he was he was opposed to bilingualism. Um, you know, as you know, I'm wearing a liberal button. Obviously, I'm, I have my liberal leanings. But um, uh, one of the things that's interesting about Premier Higgs is that his opposition to bilingualism actually wasn't coming from a place of, of, of hatred from one ethnic group from another. What's interesting about Premier Higgs is that his opposition to bilingualism was purely from an economic perspective. So he was saying, we just can't afford, he was saying we can't afford bilingualism in New Brunswick when it, was, when it, when it first took root. Um, what he what he is what he what he has said in the years moving forward is um, is that he's come to realize that that it was 
that it was a necessary thing, that it is that it is the, the will of the people and it is the law of the land and, and to undo it would be a mistake. And, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I say that denoting my background because it, in, our, in our present era, it's important to look at people from other political parties as political opponents, but not evil, subhuman, wick, wicked to the core uh, villains. We, we are currently in a more divided time than we have ever been here in Western Canada. Has that spilled over to the Atlantic uh, provinces? Is, uh, yeah. uh, is New Brunswick sort of, uh, is it safe from the polarization of politics today? Or has it creeped into the, the provincial level and even municipal level of politics out there as well? New Brunswick, Chris, in, in my opinion, New Brunswick is actually the origin in, in sort of sort of like a, uh, like a lot of a lot of hamburger chains test in the United States test what they're going to do for new products in Dayton, Ohio. New Brunswick is almost like the testing ground for for a lot of more, of the more divisive politics in New Brunswick because because we have that because we're a mix of English and French, rural and small cities. It makes it makes it makes an interesting test market. So what we saw in the 2018 election win, when, um, when Brian Gallant uh, ran against, against Blaine Higgs, and I was actually a very vocal opponent of uh, liberal premier Brian Gallant in that election, because what we saw in that election that was so bad for society and is spilling over into Canada as a whole is because we had the populist anti-bilingualism People's Alliance Party of New Brunswick what the what the then premier of New Brunswick, Brian Gallant, tried to do, in my opinion and in my assessment, Brian Gallant tried to inflame and aggravate every one of their grievances and their brand of grievance pol politics in the hopes of driving as many traditional progressive conservative voters from the progressive conservative camp into the People's Alliance camp thus allowing wow. thus allowing liberals to win with a lower threshold so one one one, one example of this um, the liberal government of brian gallant uh, changed the way that arts funding was done in new brunswick he divide, he split he created a whole new entity that would decide on funding for francophone artists whereas before there had been arts in the and, and the new brunswick arts board that had that had just decided on funding as an arm's length institution for all New Brunswick's artists. So there was, there was, in my opinion, a very concerted effort to aggravate and inflame all of these grievances. And um, just to let you know, Chris, like in most parts of New Brunswick, nobody who is not a constitutional language lawyer, a lawyer specializing in language law and bilingualist language law in New Brunswick, literally nobody but that very specialized group understands constitutionality of New Brunswick's official bilingualism and language laws, including a lot of very highly educated professional practitioners of politics. Because it, it's, it's, it's an extremely nuanced subject. So when you start talking to people who live in Anglophone rural New Brunswick, who have a lot of the, a lot of the challenges of people living in rural areas where there's fewer economic opportunities in general, um, Bilingualism makes a great a great canvas onto which to project your own insecurities, grievances, fears about the future, in concerns about a world where your where your influence is waning. So we um, so we see we we saw a lot of that in New Brunswick in the 2018 election. Um, Brian Gallant lost that election, and where I will give Brian Gallant credit is after losing the election, Brian Gallant then went on a small tour of New Brunswick, like a mini apology tour after losing that election to try to rebuild some of some of the some of that social cohesion within, within New Brunswick society. So I actually give Brian Gallant a, a lot of credit for that. I've gotten to know him. I've gotten to know Brian just a little bit uh, since that election, that election transpired. And, and um, you know, though he's somebody I, I opposed in that election, somebody I've gotten to know and, and quite like since since then. And I think I think losing an election and losing your job in front of the whole province and the media watching is a punishment in and of itself. Yeah. And there's uh, 
and and uh, he's somebody I've I've quite come to like and and, uh, and respect since then. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit CalgaryCaesarFest.com and get your tickets today. Do federal politics play a major role in New Brunswick? Because here in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, even Ontario, it's the age old adage that, especially in Ontario, we'll take Ontario first, but if the federal government goes liberal, you guarantee that the uh, provincial government will go uh, opposite, will we'll go conservative. So during the McGuinty years, Harper was in power. During the Wynn years, the Harper was in power, and then a little bit of uh, Justin Trudeau as well. Now that Justin Trudeau's in, Doug Ford's in. Here in the Prairie Provinces, we hate Justin Trudeau, and the liberals are quite, uh, the conservatives are quite open about that, and they that's their attack. They don't attack the official opposition, they attack the federal government. In New Brunswick, do federal politics play a major role in the day-to-day going on? Because you talked about how Blaine Higgs is sort of piggybacking on what Scott Moe and Jason Kenney are doing with the anti-carbon tax, anti-coalition with the NDP. But is that just a new thing? Or even with the liberals in power, it does play a major role of who's in power in Ottawa? One, one, of, one of the, and, that, and that's a very good question, Chris, one of the, one of the interesting things in New Brunswick, uh, compared to, say, Ontario, where, where you have, where you cut your political teeth, is that in, in Ontario, federal and provincial ridings are basically identical in terms, in terms of their geography and size, whereas in New Brunswick, a federal riding has roughly 80,000 people, whereas provincial ridings have roughly 15,000 people. So provincial politics is a lot more personal. And I think that that's part of the reason why we have that, that slightly different flavor of progressive conservative governments here in Atlantic Canada. So, so just, to, just to give you this, people from Ontario always find the statistic interesting, is that in Ontario, I believe that with a population of roughly 14.75 million people, I believe you have 125 MPPs or members of provincial politics, or 123 members of. I was going to say 121. If I, if last count, I think I can remember is 121, but it could be 123 as well. Okay, well, that, that, so that that that's, that sounds right. So in 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 the three maritime provinces of Nova Scotia, PEI, and New Brunswick, provincial politics for a population of just less than two million people has 125 representatives in provincial government. So it's a so it's a very it's a very different and more personal side to campaign that's a lot of it's based on personal relationships. So that's that that's where it's a little bit different. Um, where where I think where I think some of it is in is in reaction to is uh, is where New Brunswick becomes a great place to to test out new forms of campaigning. So when when the when the Liberal Party launched their liberalist backend database that was in, that was built by the NGP uh, corporate NGP Van Corporation uh, that was initially launched by the Obama people. New yep. Brunswick was the first place they ever had a, a bilingual version of NGP Van that was used, and that was used in the 2014 provincial election here in New Brunswick. So, so let so let me know let me know if this sounds familiar to you. you we have a digitally savvy campaign a bilingual candidate with matinee idol good looks who who speaks perfect english and french and figured out how to and figured out how to defeat a conservative incumbent if i was to describe that candidate would you say oh that sounds a lot like justin trudeau right it does, and I, I, I didn't know that Liberalist was actually piloted in the province of New Brunswick prior to its 
roll out in 2015's federal election because and anyone who's listened to the show knows i ran for the liberals federally in 2015 here in the province of alberta so it's not no it's no common uh, secret that i at one time did support the liberal party of canada i i do not right now there's some things going on with that party that we that's that's a whole other conversation we could have for another day but i i didn't know that and i'm surprised that people don't realize that because New Brunswick is truly the only official bilingual province. It actually does have that great French-English divide because the closer you get to Quebec, the more French speakers you have, the further south you get, the more uh, Anglophones you have. I'm so, I am I com- did not know that. Darcy, you just introduced me to a whole new world of New Brunswick politics. <laughs> Well, well, well. Let, let me let me let me take it back a step further because there's there's somebody who I think is does not get their fair shake in the history of the evolution of of Canadian liberal politics, and that is a gentleman based out of Ontario who I've who I've befriended in the last year, who's named Brad Rubinoff. Brad oversaw the Liberalist database for the 2014 Ontario campaign of Kathleen Wynne's Liberals, then went to Nova Scotia and did it for the Stephen McNeil Liberals in in their 2014 provincial campaign, and then came to New Brunswick and did it for the provincial Liberals in their 2014 campaign, and then in the 2015 federal campaign did it in St. John for my friend uh, Wayne Long, who I've campaigned with and and through whom I've gotten to know Brad Rubinoff. So he's he's one of the innovators of Canadian politics. He no longer works in Canadian politics, so I want to give give him a shout out because he's one of the great innovators who I think deserves his his note in history. While I don't know him personally, I've heard the name not more more than once in the last uh, my, in my lifetime. So I completely understand where you're coming from on that statement. Um, <laughs> I, I want to continue with this divide of the Anglophone and the Francophone in uh, uh, New Brunswick before we go to the other big story that's happening in New Brunswick, and that is how we are in a leadership race in New Brunswick with the uh, New Brunswick Liberals, and. Right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I I don't know the full map of the province, and you know it a lot better than I do, but the PCs do not hold a riding that is strongly Francophone. The Liberals are mm-hmm. traditionally better in the Francophone riding than Anglophone. While politics divides us as a nation already, does having two parties who only represent a Francophone side of the province and an Anglophone side of the province is it detrimental to the province when the government is trying to represent the Francophones but doesn't really have uh, representation in their cabinet, in their uh, caucus? And does it hurt the Liberals when they have a caucus made up of mostly Francophone ridings trying to represent all of the ridings and trying to win the hearts and minds of Anglophones, Anglophiles in the province as well? Is that an actual thing? And how do the parties need to come together and sort of battle back against the idea that the liberals are only francophones and the pcs are only anglophones that, that, that's that's a great question that's in the, and that's actually a great segue into, into talking about the leadership race yeah um that's a it's actually it's actually a very good segue um i've i've been, I've been chatting with, with some of with, with some of the really smart people from across canadian politics on on twitter over the last few days and it, it, it's my belief that in in modern politics in order to win, you have to, you don't necessarily have to like it, but you have to respect how important the smartphones we all keep in our pockets are, in addition to the algorithms that decide which information is, 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 is most easily and most likely to appear in your newsfeed on those on those on those social media platforms. So I think as the New Brunswick Liberals are 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 deciding on their next can their next uh, leader, they need they need to look at a can a candidate who can win in the reality of a social media dominated campaign. So if 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 I'm talking to if I'm talking to people say my my parents age who are like I don't like what social media is done to politics. They they don't necessarily they don't necessarily have to like it, but they have to. What I what I remind people of is that classic debate between 
Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy, where 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 Richard Nixon refused to shave and he bought some he bought some weird cover up for his five o'clock shadow. And then he went on this new medium called television and he was sweating profusely and he looked like a, like a lunatic. And, and, and everybody who watched it on TV thought that he looked out of touch, he looked crazy, and he looked like he was not a leadership, a leader for the, new, for the 1960s. Whereas John F. Kennedy went on there, he looked suave, he talked about his new, his new horizon, his vision for the country, and he looked extremely modern and like a candidate that people could get behind. So if pe people don't necessarily have to like social media, but they have to understand that it is the dominant, the dominant media platform of our era. And anyone who has listened to the shows knows that I rail against social media on a regular basis because I think it does hurt our society. But at the same time, mm -hmm. there, it is a double-edged sword because Darcy and I would not be talking right now if we did not have social media. We connect it via social media. And many of our guests that have come on throughout the country have come on because of social media. So I think social media has its place, but I think politicians, from my perspective, and this is just me being me, I, I, I harken back to the days of the 90s 2000 uh, federal elections when everything was done in person. Those are the days I miss. Those are the days when actually people got out and actually door knocked and didn't just expect people to vote based on how many likes you had on Twitter. That's that's my rant for this episode. <laughs> um, let's talk about the, the 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 ongoing leadership race that finally was called two years after. Kevin Vickers, the liberal leader, stepped down after the 2020 uh, 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 provincial election. Uh, we are heading to a New Brunswick, and I just want to make sure I have the correct date here. On August 6th, New Brunswick liberals will be getting together and voting for the next leader of the party. Now, to date, there are one, two, three, four, five candidates who I can see have declared. They are Donald Arsenault, Hopefully I pronounced that right. Seamus Byrne, Robert Gavin, Govan, did I say that? Govan. Right? Govan, TJ Harvey, and Susan Holt. Now, before we get into this, I just want to take a moment and say that uh, Darcy here has a preference in the uh, part in the leadership race. So I'm just going to get him to talk about that a little bit before we get into the state of the politics and how we this led up to having a leadership race in 2022. So Darcy, why? First off, uh, you're so you're backing Susan, correct? Yes, absolutely. And and, 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 I, and I don't want to make I don't want to I don't want to be vague or try to be clever and try to hide that because I because I, I know her and I like her and I and, and I've come to the conclusion that she is the strongest candidate because I, I see her as somebody who is bilingual. She was in Northern New Brunswick and had been some campaigning on the weekend. She's a good can she's a good communicator in the digital space, however, in a constructive, fairly positive manner, but as somebody who, who is embracing the, the digital space as the space where the majority of political discourse takes place. And also um, liberals win by being small L and capital L liberals. Um, that's, not, that's, not my, that's not my brilliant uh, phrase. That's by a little fella by the name of Keith Davey, who is known as the liberal rainmaker for, for Lester B. Pearson and uh, a guy named Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and to a lesser degree to another guy, uh, Jean Chrétien, Canada's 20th and greatest prime minister. Um, so liberals win by being, by being, by being progressive. Um, liberals aren't going to win by trying to be the party of old white guys who are wealthier, Living, living on farms in Saskatchewan. There's already a party and a movement that does that very, very well. And that's not, that's not how liberals win elections here in New Brunswick or anywhere else in Canada. So we've talked, thank you for just uh, giving that clarification about your support and uh, the sort of being that small L and large L liberal. But this is uh, a leadership race that the liberals are desperately needing in this province from my <laughs> from my outsider's perspective because I, I i i try to do my politics research every time that i talk to someone but i also try to just keep up on current events the liberals have not had a permanent leader in the legislative assembly in new brunswick since brian gallant resigned as premier 
Kevin Vickers never held a seat. He took over for, for anyone who remembers Kevin Vickers, the former sergeant at arms in the House of Commons. He killed a uh, gunman in the halls of the House of Commons. He was appointed to uh, the ambassador to Ireland under Stephen Harper. He came back and he announced his bid for the leadership under uh, after Brian Gallant resigned. So the Liberals have been leaderless in the House while they do have an interim leader right now. Uh, they have been uh, without a leader and this is kind of a time when the liberals need a leader so i want to know from you from someone who follows liberal politics in the province from someone who's being sort of uh, campaigning is this too late of a time to be holding a race should we have held it a year and a half ago because just waiting two years since an election was that too late of a time like the time frame just doesn't make sense to me can you make sense for it uh, to me like because I just I, I haven't been able to make heads and tails about the decision behind holding it so late after the last election. Um, well, New Brunswick has New, New, New Brunswick has has been especially compared to where you are, Chris, in Alberta. New Brunswick has been very cautious about COVID, and because of that, we've had a very low death rate. So, by being more cautious about some of these things, we, we've it has it has borne results here in the province. So I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I think I think what the New Brunswick Liberals are doing is in keeping with public opinion and public consensus of people of, of all stripes across the province. But let, 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 let me but let me let me let me take like a real ten thousand foot view and, and and break things back and get. That's why you're back. here. That's why you're here, Darcy. So, <laughs> so so Chris in New Brunswick, the Liberal Party of New Brunswick in the past 50 years has only elected one two-term premier, Frank McKenna. In the past 50 years, only one. And as, and, and, and as somebody who follows uh, federal politics, the Liberal Party does fantastic federally in New Brunswick. So this is, this is an area that is winnable for liberals, but, liber but the Liberal Party of New Brunswick has, has chosen, it, it's chosen several one and done premiers uh, since since Frank McKenna left, so what I see in this election is that it's 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 a changing of the guard election. In, in Kevin Vickers was a very very nice man. Kevin Vickers is is, is an honorable man, and, he, and he's still a great promoter of New Brunswick and a proud and a proud New Brunswicker who represents this province well. But the once once Brian Gallant left, a lot of the old guard uh, campaigned to have him elected. Without any, any, without really any leadership race, and, um, and this is really interesting. The, uh, Michael Ignatieff was received his coronation as leader of the federal Liberals without an actual leadership race. He led that party to its worst defeat since Confederation. Kevin Vickers, who I admire, and I, and full disclosure, admire a lot more than I admire Michael Ignatieff. He was he received a coronation and then led the provincial liberals to their worst election since Confederation. So there's a, there's a pattern there. But what, what is interesting is that for the next generation of liberals, the next generation of liberals no longer have to tip the hat and defer to the old guard as as we know the drill. You guys need to you guys need to sit down here and kind of pay attention to to how we do things because we really know what we're doing here. So the old the old guard have shown that those dogs don't hunt anymore. And because again, the, the, key, the key takeaway here is in the past 50 years, one two-term premier. And that's just liberals, correct? Because if I'm not mistaken, the that, PCs have held uh, two terms, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Th that is correct. So- yeah. uh, Sean Graham was a two-term? One term. Really? You trust me. He would, if the people of New Brunswick had 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 a, got, got to renew on a two-year basis, he would have been a half term premier. Oh, okay. he was extremely unpopular at the end. He was he was run out of really? New Brunswick on a rail. He proposed selling NB Power to Hydro Quebec, and that did not play well in the language politics of New Brunswick. I did not know that. I thought he was a popular premier, but I guess not. I guess if you get turf from office, uh, again, being the outsider, right? As someone in from Alberta, you mm -hmm. you see these people and you think, oh, well, they seem to be doing well. Like, I don't know what's going on to the ground, but here we are. <laughs>
horror fans unite. The Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown is pleased to offer a free audible copy of David Mercer's newest book, Living Death, A Love Story. The book is about Nick, who having suffered the horrible loss of his wife, plays the hero and rescues Jenny from her abusive boyfriend. Deciding that he has one last adventure in him, he invites her on a cross-country road trip. Little did they know that the world, as they knew it, was ending. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca to enter into the draw. Simply tell us your favorite horror film by April 14th and be entered. The liberal- Chris, I, Chris, I told, Chris, I, Chris, I told you I was friendly with Warren Kinsella before we got into this. I know. Hey, hey, well, <laughs> hey, I'm, hey, if Warren wants to come on the show, I'd be happy to have him on, but no one seems to get back to me from Ontario. You, you, you make, you, anyway. Um, the New Brunswick Liberals have a lot of work to do ahead for the new mm-hmm. leader. The new leader while it's going to be a tough race for a lot of one of these candidates, uh, they are going to have a lot of work to do to bring the party back together, but also bring the province back together. Because uh, anyone who remembers back to uh, when the Liberals were last in power, there was allegations of uh, misconduct by the former speaker. Uh, there was uh, abortion funding issues that were coming up. So this this the party has to kind of reset in some way doesn't it to sort of take away the old and bring in the new do you think the liberals do have that ability to sort of reset the party and make it a fresh new party compared to thinking oh it's brian gallant's party but just new it's oh it's kevin vickers party it's sean graham's party do you think they can do it um i'm 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 going to uh I think I think this is one of those issues where, in order to for there to be a sort of catharsis, there needs to be a productive discussion about about the issues that are that that are in some of those wounds that are there. I think I think the mark of of good leader in in this province is going to be the person who isn't going to try to sweep all of the baggage under the rug. I think it's going to be the person who, who can who can have that discuss who can lead that discussion, but in a productive, civilized, and decent manner, in 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 in, in, in one that is driving towards solutions, not about settling old scores. So let's talk about the leadership candidates and let's dive a little bit deeper into them exactly darcy this is this is the moment darcy's been waiting for for the first half hour of the show now we're in the back half of the hour of the show and we're going to talk about the leadership candidates themselves now if i'm not mistaken you you know this will probably a little bit better there are only five candidates who have officially announced their intentions to seek the leadership correct Okay, so I'm going to go in the order I mentioned to them at the top of the, uh, in the beginning of the interview, because we'll get to you, the person you're supporting at the end, so that way we can just get some uh, clarification on some of these other candidates. I want to start with Donald Arsenault. Arsenault, I apologize if mm-hmm. I said that right. Tell me, tell me more about this guy. Former MLA, he, he, if I'm not mistaken, he lost the last election or he didn't stand for re-election in the last election? I'm so, I'm so glad you asked, Chris. This is a, um, um, I'm, I'm in, in, in speaking in speaking about um, in speaking about in speaking about the candidates in the selection. I think it's really important any leadership race be a mostly a constructive exercise. Um, Donald Arsenault is the exception who proves the rule. I did not come here to praise Caesar, but to bury him. Okay. Um, we, we we are we are not a Donald fan. It sounds like no. So 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 Don Arsenal at the end of the Brian Gallant years, Don Arsenal was simultaneously working as an MLA and a lobbyist for a union. At the end of at the end of his tenure as an MLA, he was technically found a way to weasel his way out of not being in 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 violation of the letter of the law. 
although it was it was cautioned by the conflict of interest commissioner that it was definitely not the spirit of the law. So then, in the, so then in the twenty, so then that was at the end of twenty eighteen, he got uh, Brian Gallant had to kick him out of the caucus because obviously not a good look. <laughs> nope. And then, and then in twenty twenty, he was the manager of Kevin Vickers' failed campaign that was also the biggest failure in the history of the provincial liberals since confederation so those are both those are both documented those are both documented um, those are both documented phenomena so where's his in, support come from well so here's here's what's interesting his his campaign is managed by a gentleman named victor boudreau who is also one of a former mla who is named in the as being sort of uh, one of the attack dogs in the fake me too allegations against against former speaker of the house chris collins so you have a campaign where the candidate and the campaign manager both have some serious some serious credibility issues so um if i was going to make i don't know this for a fact if, I, if i'm speculating i my 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 prediction is that much like the last um, much like the ucp leadership contest my guess is that they're going to be a, camp, a kamikaze stalking horse for for somebody else because I I don't see them as being as having any credible path to victory in in any part. Now I'm not going to say anything 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 negative about any any of any of the other leadership candidates. I think that that everybody else in this race brings something to the table. Um, in in my opinion, Don Arsenault does nothing but discredit and aggravate. Uh, any of the credibility issues of the New Brunswick Liberal Party. I, I appreciate you. I, again, I, if you don't know, if you don't live in the province, you don't know what's happening. But I'm so happy that you referenced the Kamikaze candidate because it's been very popular here. So you just gained probably about at least four or five followers on Instagram or for Twitter because, for saying that. So there you go. Um, Seamus, 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 Seamus Burns. Okay, so this this candidate, I I do not know where he came from. He kind of is this, he's a businessman in New mm -hmm. Brunswick and he kind of has come out of nowhere to announce. And I read his uh, announcement uh, news uh, article. I think it was in one of the local papers in New Brunswick. I think it was in the, the, uh, one of the times. And I was like, okay, I can see why he's running. What's his uh, play here? What what does he need to do? And is his play just I'm I'm an outsider. I've not had the politics background, and that's what we need at this time. Or am I reading too much into the fact that it's just a business businessman thinking that he could be the next premier? Uh, we're, we're New Brunswick basically has the, the, the population of a small city. We're, we're a population of under a million. I think I think to a lot of people who don't necessarily we're, we're interested in getting in. To politics, everybody who's getting into politics really doesn't know where to start. So the so the idea of of, of being the leader of an opposition party in a in a, in a small province, I I, I'm, I I think to a lot of people that that's a logical first step in in politics. The same way that somebody might think that running for mayor of Hamilton might be a logical first step at at running at, at entering politics. Yeah. Um, I I I I don't I don't think Mr. Byrne is likely to have to to I don't think he's likely to be one of the final two contenders in the race. I met I, I met him at an election event for my MP friend Wayne Long in St. John. Very, very nice man. He had some interesting ideas for the province about maybe about maybe putting tolls on uh, on the Trans Canada Highway. Um, so he's 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 trying to bring a little bit of in, intellectual depth in some policy to a leadership race. So at least, he's, at least he's showing up with ideas. And more importantly, he's putting those ideas out there in public so that they can be debated or criticized. So I, I applaud his guts and I applaud him for throwing his hat in the ring. I don't think he'll, he'll be one of the final two contenders, but I, you know, I applaud him for trying to bring a little bit of intellectual depth to the race rather than, rather than, just, than just trying to you know, shake hands, kiss babies and win based on personal charm. Just to confirm, this ballot is a ranked ballot, right? So Correct. Five, five candidates, if no other candidate enters, if I'm not sure if we've passed that cutoff time, but no candidate wins on the first ballot, bottom one gets cut off until there's two, and then someone gets 50%, correct? Correct. Perfect. 
third candidate and this this gentleman is kind of a like this is an entity in itself and i i i hardly um, can imagine that the liberals have opened a their arms with uh, loving hands to a former pc health minister turned liberal uh, I think he might might not have been health minister. It might have been. I know he was in the ministry in Blaine Higgs uh, ministry, but Robert Gavin, he former liber, former PC, w- sat as an independent, joined the Liberals, went to a new riding in the last election, the 2020 election, got elected as a Liberal. Now putting his name forward as the leadership candidate. That's a head spin if I've ever seen it. Are are people seriously considering a former PC turned liberal as their leader? Like, are people actually taking notice of Robert and what he's doing and what he's saying? Or are people just saying, okay, it's going to be Blaine Higgs 2.0? Uh, I, I, so I, I really like, I really like Robert Coban. The last time, the last time I ran into it was actually a, a public demonstration uh, trying to get more affordable public housing and better housing policy. New Brunswick, where he was out, you know, talking to talking to ordinary people. Um, uh, one one thing to remember, Chris, is that New Brunswick, the New Brunswick of, of Frank McKenna, was one of the early pioneers of the so-called third way of politics, where you had a little bit of the right, a little bit of the left, and their best ideas. And you could, and, and it was a way for 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 liberal leaning parties to win in places that had previously been dominated by, by conservative politicians for, for generations. So in 1987, Frank McKenna pioneered a form of campaigning that worked for Bill Clinton, who's a good friend of who's a good friend of McKenna's, though I don't think he mentions it as often these days. <laughs> um, uh, Tony Blair and Jean Chrétien. So a lot of people in New Brunswick um, have a history and a comfort with the so-called third way of politics. And um, so to so a lot of people, that's a formula for winning. Uh, coming back to our previous discussion on social media, social media, I, I really like Robert. I think that the Liberal Party should have always been Robert's home. Um, and, and, and he, I think in his heart, he always was, was a Liberal. His father was, was a red Tory, Richard Hatfield, uh, MLA in the 70s and 80s. So he had that, he had that the, the family history there, but I think he I think he realized that in, in today's landscape he is a liberal. However, um, trying to come up the middle with that third way, I don't think it works in, the, in in an era of social media. Social media algorithms are geared towards content that elicits a strong emotional reaction from the viewer. So I don't think I, I whereas the era of of 24-hour cable news and newspapers, the the worst thing that could happen would be that you'd upset in a lot of people and cause a strong emotional reaction. That was like worst case scenario. Whereas in in, in in a social media time, you really want that strong reaction. And I don't and I and, and I think that sort of third way mix of the left, mix of the right is not is not the formula for winning. How, how though I do really like the the practitioner in Robert Gobat who's a very nice person. We've talked about social media a lot. Before we get to the next two candidates, the last two candidates that have announced so far, I want to... Social media plays a heavy factor in Western politics. It is like the bee's knees. You are on social media, you get your social media out. Like, and you use hashtags. And when I look at New Brunswick politics and even Nova Scotia politics and even PEI politics, it doesn't seem like social media is used by a lot more, used by residents. Am I wrong to believe that? Like, it seems like people actually want to have a conversation with their politician instead of sending 280 characters on Twitter to their politician to get an answer. Do, do, do uh, Maritimers actually care about politics in the point where we're not willing to go to the political divide of social media? Or am I just not searching the right corner of Twitter to find these uh, people who are talking about uh, maritime politics on social media? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't live in Alberta, so, I, so it's hard for me to compare it to Alberta. However, I think uh, because it is smaller, like I said before, because it is smaller writings, it is a little bit more personal in nature. 
and because it's a smaller in the in, remember you're in the you're in the province with the youngest average in terms of population age maritime provinces have the oldest median age so you're 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 you've got a lot of people who maybe maybe think it's uncivilized to be <laughs> that's to true. to play that to play that attack dog on on social media and you're and you're also you've got a smaller population so you're going to have more people that that like you know, if you have a thousand, if you if you have a if you're an MLA in Atlantic Canada with a thousand Facebook followers, that's considered. Uh, I've 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 never seen a candidate with on their political page that had a thousand uh, followers for their political page who ever lost. Whereas whereas in for a even for a provincial candidate in a place like Edmonton, that would be considered that would be considered. Uh, very small and would not be considered a big success. So, so I, I think for, for somebody like you coming from Alberta and Ontario, it's hard for you to really think on the scale because just because of your own experience. Well, and, and, and that's the thing. I completely agree with that. I, I will, I would, I would never try to put myself in someone else's shoes, especially when it comes to politics in other provinces. But I, I just find it fascinating that like other provinces rely so heavily on social media that like like you said i i i i followed the politics the last election where blaine higgs won his majority and i i remember seeing stories and hearing uh, for, uh like of reading newspaper articles where the per their fellow candidate whether it be the liberal or the conservative was their neighbor was their like they knew them personally like in pei they, uh the uh, leader of the official opposition and the premier the premier's dentist is the leader of the official opposition. It is so different, and there's such a different culture when it comes to politics where we don't want to get into the, the, the dirty deeds of social media where we're attacking each other. And I'm, I'm so happy that at least someone in this country does that. So that's my, again, second rant for the day. I apologize. But let's get back to the big thing that we wanted to talk about, and that is the leadership race. TJ Harvey, former member of parliament for New Brunswick, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, a one term uh liberal mp uh, in justin trudeau's 2015 uh, landslide of the maritimes he resigned or didn't stand for re-election in 2019 he's putting himself forward what's your thoughts on tj he he has an incredible organization he has he has he has a very strong drive he comes from a political family he had a a cousin andrew harvey who was an mla in that area, he comes from he comes from the part of the province, Chris, where McCain Foods is based, near, in potato growing country in western New Brunswick, uh, near Florenceville, Bristol. So that's one of the key that's one of the key battlegrounds for for a for a winning a winning party. And that's one of those and that's one of those key bilingual ridings that can swing liberal or conservative in a province where there aren't very many. Where there aren't very many. No. Oh. One second. I'm, I'm in a public library. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't be. If we're gonna if we're gonna get into liberal politics, we need to be we need to be in a liberal space. <laughs> you, you don't you don't need to edit that part out. I think it's very quaint. I think it's awesome that you're sitting in a liberal uh, in, a, in a library just talking politics and people are just. I didn't realize this. I thought you were at home or something, but no, you're sitting and talking politics. But TJ Harvey, I, I hear the person behind you has stopped talking. <laughs> yeah, so so TJ TJ Harvey, who I think is is very professional. He had a very professional he had a very professional launch video. But I again, um, like like Robert Gauvin, I, I I see I see TJ Harvey though very professional and a very capable. Um, practitioner of politics, again a former MP, I see him as taking that third way approach that that maybe does not that does not embrace the fact that that you, that one needs to have a position that elicits a strong emotional reaction on social media. So um, if you watch his launch video, which is extremely professional. Um, if you looked at it and I told you that it was the launch video for a somebody who was campaigning to be the PC premier of Nova Scotia, you might believe me. And if I told you that it was for somebody who was campaigning to be the liberal premier of Prince Edward Island, you'd probably also believe me. Um, it's, 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 it's a little bit too 
up the middle, in my opinion, for our for our present landscape, though very professional. And uh, I've, I've met TJ a couple of times, and he's a very intelligent, and capable practitioner of politics. I think I think he'll be I think he'll be very successful. Um, what what I myself am looking for in a candidate is somebody who can win two terms and do a good job of governing the province uh, for two terms, who can win an, a, a general election and a re-election. And as, as you know, most, most who campaign for the leadership of a liberal party, uh, they, don't they don't tend to do a bad, they don't tend to be unsuccessful by looking electable in a general election. And in, in my opinion, Susan Holt is, is, is the strongest is the strongest candidate for winning a general election, governing, doing a good job of governing, and then winning a re-election for a second term, in my own opinion. Well, let's talk about Susan Holt here for a second, because she is the last candidate. I know you have 10 minutes. I'm going to try and wrap this up after we talk about Susan Holt. So I just have one thing I want to say about Susan Holt, but then I'll let throw it over to you. Susan Holt worked in the Premier's office under Brian Gallant. Uh, she was, uh, if, I'm not sure what her role in the uh, the part of the office was, but she was she was a staffer. She has announced she is the first woman to put her name forward for the Liberal uh, Party in New Brunswick. What does that mean? And what are your thoughts on her as you've already mentioned them? So. Yeah, so in, in, terms, in terms of her connection to Brian Gallant, who I've, well, even in this interview, I've been, I've been very critical of. Um, uh, Susan Holt had a, had a position in the civil service. When, when Ms. Holt decided she was going to seek a nomination and run for public office, uh, she felt it was a conflict of interest to be a, a, in a position of responsibility as a civil service. So she left that position, very briefly worked in the premier's office of Brian Gallant, uh, and she actually campaigned while on maternity leave. So her, her her time in Brian Gallant's premier's office was short. Um, if, 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 if I were advising Susan, it would be not to try to sweep that under the rug, but to make it a, a badge of privilege that you worked in the premier's office shortly because you did not want to be in, in a conflict of interest because you care about integrity and transparency. Um, it's, 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 better to, it's better to have worked in the premier's office of Brian Gallant for a brief period than to be a senior civil service in a conflict of interest while while running for, for public office, in, in my opinion. So it's it, it was not it was not a long it was not a long tenure. My last question before we get out of here, because I, I see that you are uh, we're on a time frame here because the library is closing, as they would say. Um, is this a strong field of candidates? I think it is, and, 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 and again, going through the, going through our breakdown, I think we have um, I think we have a very strong uh, we have very strong regional representation. Um, in my in my opinion, um, Susan Holtz, T.J. Harvey, and Robert Govan are the three are the three front runners. Um, uh, Robert Govan comes from Shippigan. He currently lives in Moncton. He is a Francophone. Susan Holtz is a female who lives in Fredericton where the controversial uh, abortion clinic 554 is based and is a major issue and is an issue that she can talk about well. Andrew Harvey comes from an agricultural family. He lives in rural, Harvey. sorry, TJ Harvey, not, thank you for correcting me. TJ Harvey comes from rural Western New Brunswick and a different region. So you have three different regions. You have uh, English and French, you have male and female. I think it's a very healthy field for having a discussion. And I think, and I think of the three front runners. I think you have people who would all, who are all cabinet minister material. I think you have three people who could all grow the party, could all win swing ridings. So I think it's very healthy. Well, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. We will have you back on before this April 6th leadership race. I will be live in New Brunswick for the results of the leadership race. We are planning on making it out to New Brunswick for August 6th announcement. So we might actually meet in person, Darcy. Oh, that's pretty cool. 
yeah so we're, we're bringing the show on the road we're going to try and cover as many leadership races across this country as possible but with that uh everyone if you've seen the show and listened to the show before you know what i'm about to say the link to darcy's uh, social media handles are in the show notes check them out follow him because he does talk about politics a lot and then if you want to reach out to him if you have a question about politics in new brunswick he'd probably be happy to answer them uh with that uh my name is christopher brown for the cross-border interviews with chris brown have yourself an excellent day and remember guys have a conversation get it from behind social media and talk to someone be like new brunswickers and have a conversation talk to you later guys Thank you.